Welcome back to the test lab. I'm your host, Dr. Watt, here with another test fest of photonically active conversation. In today's episode, we're taking our first look at double-ended metal halide technology, comparing it to its inspiration, its older brother, and a crazy cousin from out of town in order to see if it cuts the mustard. Now, before we go on, I have a quick confession to make. This episode wasn't actually on the schedule. I'd like to kick his ass just once. The story actually begins a few months ago, when Solis Tech had sent us a consignment of bulbs which included three double-ended metal halides. One 4K, one 6K and one 10K, these same metal halide bulbs as seen in episode 3, our single-ended metal halide mega test. For months these bulbs sat on a shelf not doing anything, until a few weeks ago I picked up on some heated conversations in online forums. When I started researching the subject, the reactions I got from contacts in the growing field and the agrotech field are what I can only call passionate responses. What is your major malfunction, numbnuts? As a non-grower, I found the argument so fascinating that I decided to insert this special episode into our already packed schedule. The basics of the argument are actually quite simple, but do require a short history lesson. For the majority of indoor gardening's brief time in the sun, one lighting technology has been a dominant force. I am of course talking about high pressure sodium. The reason for its success has been its outstanding ability to convert watts of electrical energy into micromoles of usable power far more efficiently than any other available technology. The only shade you can throw at HPS is the fact that its spectra isn't very sun-like. And it's for this very reason that many turn to another high-intensity discharge technology, which has a far superior spectra than HPS, but which lags far behind in micromoles per watt and lifespan. This is why metal halide is mainly used in propagation and vegetative phases, but bulking and flowering is done under high pressure sodium. Although 2005 will not exactly be remembered by the world at large as a hotbed of revolutionary ideas, the indoor gardening world was rocked by a big one. Philips revolutionized the HPS concept with its development of double-ended high pressure sodium. It was even more efficient than HPS at converting watts to micromoles and also had a slightly improved spectra. It quickly became the de facto standard for indoor high volume growers, but despite all of its gains, it's still held back by its relatively weak spectra. To many growers, the obvious next question then became, so if double-ended high pressure sodium is so great, why doesn't someone do the same thing for metal halide? And it's this idea that DEMH will be almost as good as DEHPS that's at the heart of the fight. God damn you all to hell! You see, it's a profound mistake to think that high pressure sodium and metal halide technologies are easily interchangeable like this. When the double-ended HPS lamp was developed, it used several key improvements to optimize the output of a high-pressure sodium bulb. A shorter, thinner arc tube containing a more intense reaction. A simplified structure to minimize lost energy and improved materials to further minimize losses. But all of those improvements were specifically designed for high-pressure sodium and don't necessarily mean they'll work for metal halide. Indeed, this is not a format that's been designed for metal halide's optimized reaction, as it's in the same bulb jacket as DEHPS, and so could be limited by that fact alone. It's also worth mentioning that only three manufacturers have entered the DEMH space, and none of them are the developer of DEHPS. Philips, interestingly enough, went in a completely different direction and developed ceramic metal halide technology. CMH both improves the watts to micromoles efficiency levels and the spectra over the metal halide by using a more intense arc reaction enabled by a sintered alumina arc tube similar to that of high pressure sodium. 
And although these are currently only available in 315 watt bulbs, they can be run in double bulb fixtures, giving a more reasonable 630 watts of output, which could put them in a reasonable playing field with single-ended metal halide and perhaps even double-ended metal halide. Now, the party trick with CMH is its extremely long bulb life, up to 24,000 hours in optimum conditions. This is exactly the opposite approach pushed by DEMH. When you compare DEMH with DEHPS, the only major difference is the arc tube within the bulb, which, if you remember, is sintered alumina in HPS bulbs, but is just quartz in metal halide. In DEMH, the arc tube is essentially a stretched version of a single-ended arc tube in a double-ended HPS casing. So what, you may be asking? Well, there's a reason that almost all metal halides have very short arc tubes. Arc bowing. You see, it's called an arc for a reason. Arc bowing is the reason that burning a metal halide bulb horizontally gives it only a lifespan of 10,000 hours instead of 20,000 hours in a vertical base-up configuration. The shorter lifespan is caused by the upward bowing of the arc between the two electrodes. The closer the electrodes, the smaller the arc. The further apart, well, you get the idea. A stretched tube like this means a larger arc, which is a problem because a larger arc will make more contact with the quartz. The contact will accelerate the ion creep phenomenon, suggesting that these bulbs will have a very short lifespan, with a potentially nasty end. This is a little bit concerning because it worries at least one of the manufacturers enough to double jacket their bulb. Oh my God, help me, I don't wanna die! The moment you run a DEMH bulb in any fixture or reflector that doesn't match the bulb manufacturer, you've pretty much voided the warranty. There are features included in double-ended high-pressure sodium ballasts that don't play well with metal halide technology. You have been warned. Lastly, but with no less importance, I've heard that there is a chance that these bulbs, which are already known for their juicy UV spectrum in the first place, also could generate dangerous levels of UVB and even UVC in double-ended. I couldn't measure this as our spectrometer is calibrated purely for PAR, and photosynthetically active radiation is defined from 400 to 700 nanometers. Our spectrometer actually goes down to around 380 or 385 nanometers or so, but nowhere deep enough to detect UVB and UVC. And so, these deep levels of UV are almost invisible to our test. And that worries me because all of the spectral captures I took suggest lots of UV. And if UVC is there, it's a very, very bad thing. You see, UVC is very nasty stuff that's absorbed completely by the Earth's atmosphere. Google it and scare yourself silly. Today we're only looking at the Solitec bulbs to see if double-ended metal halide is actually worth all the hype. This test is actually really simple. We're taking the test data from last episode's DEHPS bulb test and using it as the basis of the first part of our comparison test. We're going to test all three DEMH bulbs and compare them at 48 inches to the original DEHPS bulb the Philips Master Green Power. Why? Well, as Philips is the daddy of DE, it seems only fair. This first test will give us an idea of if it cuts the mustard in the intensity stakes. Then, we'll be grabbing the same single-ended 4K, 6K and 10K bulbs from episode 3 and retesting them at the same height as episode 3, 24 inches, but this time using a new single-ended radiant reflector and the same power box we used in the DEHPS tests. We're doing this so we have controls in the type of reflector and the ballast. 
This allows us to also test the DEMH bulbs at the same 24 inches to gain a single-ended versus double-ended comparison. For the final part of this comparison test, we're going to be testing a 630 watt LEC from Sunlight Supply in a tent at the same 24 inches. We'll even retest the single-ended metal halide mega test winner to see how that fares. We'll be recording all of the usual data using our 25 point canopy test on the 5 foot by 5 foot grid in our tent, but this time at heights of both 24 and 48 inches. As usual, we'll be including intensity maps, the canopy average, and uniformity ratios for each test versus the existing test data from previous episodes. Plus, of course, all the usual conditions data sampled during each test. Before we get to the results, I'm afraid I have to tell you that a demon from episode 6 rose its ugly head again. But no, this doesn't mean that I broke any bulbs this time. Instead of being too long, this time they were too short. So short, in fact, that the shortest had to be supported while the sliding retaining clips were slid across, as the springs wouldn't connect with the bulb. And you had to remember it was loose, a simple forgetful slip could cost you an expensive trip to the store. Now you may be thinking I'm being too harsh here. Loud noises! But I find when it comes to quality control, some messages speak louder than others. Bang! Settle it. With all of this being said, what do the numbers tell us? Well, that's where, of course, the story gets more interesting. Let's begin by gauging the intensity of the DEMH bulbs by comparing them to the current benchmark, double-ended high-pressure sodium. As we expected, it's not exactly a photo finish. The DEHPS comfortably beats all three DEMH bulbs by a pretty wide margin at this height. It's 26% up over the 4K bulb, 37% up on the 6K bulb, and almost 38% up on the 10K bulb. However, maximum intensity is only one part of the equation. How do we express efficiency and cost? Efficiency is pretty simple. We just take the canopy average we generate and divide it by the power drawn in watts to get a figure we call micromoles per watt. And it's here that the DEHPS advantage becomes clear. It generates 0.47 micromoles per watt of electricity, compared to the 0.35 of the 4K and 0.29 of the 6K and 10K bulbs. It may not sound like much, but trust me, this number is huge when scaled up in a large facility. The final metric I'd like to introduce you to is economic efficiency. This essentially shows you the cost of your light by volume. We find this number by taking the bulb's manufacturer's suggested retail price and dividing it by the bulb's output to give us a metric called cost per micromole. With these two new data points, the advantage of DEHPS is crystal clear. It's both electrically and economically superior by a comfortable margin. Its only real weakness is its spectra. In addition, remember that this Philips bulb only placed fourth in our episode 6 mega test. There are stronger bulbs available. Let's move on to the 24 inch tests and we'll begin by keeping it in the family by testing double ended versus single ended directly to see if the DE bulbs really are better than their SE versions. If you're expecting a whipping, you're in for a shock. Starting with the 4K, we see an 8.5% boost in intensity. For the 6K, that falls to just 6.3%, with only the 10K bulb hitting a mark similar to the DEHPS's advantage over its single-ended ancestor. As a side note, it's interesting to also see that the single-ended 10K actually has a better spectrum than the double-ended 10K. So yes, double-ended is more intense than single-ended, but not by much. And as we saw previously, intensity is only part of the full picture. But before we compare electrical and economic efficiencies, let's look at the other two test subjects. 
And next is the turn of ceramic metal halide. Looking at the maps side by side gives a solid impression that double-ended metal halide sits pretty comfortably. But again, more data significantly changes the picture. The 4K bulb pounds the CMH into submission. It has over a 23% advantage in raw horsepower terms. But looking at the spectra suggests the reverse. The ceramic metal halide has the best spectrum to be found in high intensity discharge lamps. Also, take a look at the wattage drawn by the CMH. It may be 23% down in intensity, but that's not surprising because it's using 31% less power. And it's a very similar story for the 6K bulb, but with a diminished advantage of just 11%. The 10K bulb is a mere 3% over the CMH, despite pulling almost a third more power. This should translate into some very interesting numbers when we compare efficiency and cost. But before we do, let me introduce you to the joker in this pack. The Genesis single-ended metal halide bulb that won the single-ended mega test from episode 3. We added it to this test when we noticed that the intensity figures put down by the single-ended Solistec bulbs were nearly double those we collected with the second-hand Daystar and Ballast that we used for the first round of single-ended tests. We were curious as to what the new single-ended Radiant and Power Box would do for the Genesis, and so I stayed late to run some extra tests. And boy, am I glad I did. Straight out of the gate, it blasted the 4K bulb by 8.5%. And it didn't get any better from there, as the 4K bulb has consistently been the most intense of the three DEMH bulbs. It pummeled the 6K bulb by 21% and gave the 10K bulb an atomic wedgie of 28% superiority. So now we've gotten these 24 inch test results together, let's see how the electrical and economic efficiency picture looks. Starting with the maps side by side presents a straight shootout between the double-ended metal halide bulbs and the Genesis for Top Dog. Adding spectral graphs turns that idea on its head. This ceramic metal halide has the most spectacular spectral output we've seen. When we add the canopy average data and the power draw figures, it adds a layer of complexity. The Genesis wins out by almost 60 micromoles on average, and the CMH looks much weaker, although it can boast the best uniformity of the test. The efficiency data, micromoles per watt, changes the picture again. The efficiency numbers echo the map and canopy average by giving the Genesis 0.67 micromoles per watt, and a comfortable win. However, look again at the ceramic metal halide. If its strong showing surprises you, it's because you forgot it's only a 630 watt fixture. So the 494 micromoles it generates is achieved using over 25% less power. In addition to its very long bulb life, it does make for a compelling argument. That is, until we add costs into the equation. With two bulbs at almost $105 a pop, not to mention the cost of the fixture, the economic argument for CMH is a tough case to make without seeing how long they last in the field. But that spectrum, oh, that spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The economic efficiency data underscores the real cost of these lights. And in that, there's a very clear message to be gained from this test. New technologies aren't always better technologies. The one major data point that could really transform this test is bulb longevity, as it's the other economic key question. All of these spectra and intensity readings are from new bulbs, but bulbs degrade, and all of the lifetime figures available are for ultimate bulb life in perfect conditions. In other words, they're not switched off. This means the bulbs you buy for your garden are never going to last that long. Kind of like moles per gallon figures on new cars. And so, we have to work with the numbers we can generate, as some simple napkin math tells me that to test all of these bulbs to exhaustion would cost around $15,000 in electrical costs alone. And you have offended a shopping temple. So what conclusions can we draw from this mountain of data? Starting with the simple stuff, yes, DEMH is more intense than its single-ended counterparts, but not by much. 
Economically speaking, it's the other way round. Single-ended is better than double-ended. Single-ended is both cheaper to purchase and maintain, which is underscored by the Genesis results. If you need Spectra, you can't go wrong with CMH. And although it is very pricey to purchase, its increased longevity and high efficiency should soften the blow. Be wary of DEMH bulbs in open fixtures. UVC is absorbed by glass, so isn't present or an issue for the single-ended versions of these bulbs. But double-ended bulb jackets are made of quartz, and that doesn't stop UVC. Double-ended metal halide is an expensive alternative to single-ended, unless your garden is already 100% double-ended HPS. But even then, you'll be voiding all of your fixtures' warranties unless they happen to match the bulb's brand. So that about wraps up this first comparison test. I hope you found it informative and that I didn't drown you too much in numbers. I'm not even sorry. But we do feel it's very important for growers to educate themselves on the real world costs of lighting systems as the industry is positively exploding at the moment. And as a result, it's harder now more than ever before to read between the lines. But that's why we're here. So that's all for this episode. If you liked it, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you really liked it, help spread the word. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Tesla.